computer and there we go after that part um i can stop recording then re-record after i just want to make sure that i'll then for the thank you and so with regard to what we just talked about this affordable housing series we've been really producing um some excellent sort of different possibilities for oh there's someone coming just in now. Different possibilities for how we can, in South Etobicoke, really get our minds around and see how we can contribute within. Um, we obviously know there's, there's an extensive problem across Toronto. What we're seeing in South Etobicoke, I'll let um, Kate and Jasmine maybe talk about slightly after. But we wanted to figure out how alternatives to this housing crisis can be presented. So just the little welcome, we have um, the land acknowledgement to go after, introductions of the hosts and speakers, the meeting guidelines, uh, the trends we're seeing in Etobicoke Ward 3, Lake Shore, Etobicoke Lakeshore, information session, and this is just what the purpose of this meeting is, uh, resources, and then questions and discussion. So I'll just briefly go through these and do them uh, due diligence, and then I'll take a pause, and then we can all sort of collect ourselves afterwards uh, before moving to Angela's presentation. Okay, so as we gather here today, we would like to acknowledge that we are meeting on the lands for those thousands of years before us was the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nations, Ojibwe, and the Anishinaabek, who own or named this land Adobicoke. Others include the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nations and the Métis Nation. This land is covered by Treaty 13, the Toronto Purchase from Etobicoke Creek to the west to Ashbridge's Bay to the east. It is our collective responsibility to honor and respect those who have gone before us, those who are here, those who have yet to come. We are grateful for the opportunity to be working on this land. As we, are, as we are committed to rebuilding, some call it reconciliation and fostering the distinct contributions of the First Peoples of Canada. And um, when we're giving the land acknowledgement, some wording has changed in some nations. Uh, there are many Métis nations here, in fact, now. Uh, it's really, really interesting work. And, and I'm always interested to see how that shifts. The more we learn, the more it shifts within conversations within the Mississaugas of the Credit. Uh, and so let's moving on to the meeting guidelines. Please be respectful and kind, respect others for being non-judgmental and by maintaining the confidentiality of this space, honor the speakers in the group by staying present and mute your video as well if you need to attend to something. Share the air by keeping your questions not too long, one or two per person if possible. This is a safe space for all attendees. And we say that not to be unkind in any way, it's just that sometimes we have larger groups and we'd like to make sure everyone has the opportunity to have their questions asked. Um, and with regard to that meeting guidelines continued in the code of conduct, we try our best to make sure that everyone in the room is respectful. If there's a disruption, we'll remove any unwanted guests and proceed within the workshop. Please introduce yourself in the chat box if you feel comfortable and share which neighborhood you're living in if you feel comfortable as well. If you're calling in on the phone, press star six to mute or unmute and star nine to raise your hand. We will go to the phones to allow questions as well. Um, again, the moderator, I've introduced myself prior, um, but I'll do so for those that newly joined us. Thank you so much. Um, I'm Vanessa Keel Vehar of Humber Lamp uh, Community Health Center and the CBASE, which is the Community Benefits Agreements in South Etobicoke. So I'm going to introduce others um, that are helping today. So Lahag speaker Kate O'Neill and Lamp Health Promoter Extraordinaire Jasmine Dew. Um, they may pop in. Uh, uh, Kate's going to give a little introduction about Lahag and their important work also. And then Jasmine maybe will pop in as well to talk. But please welcome our guest speaker, Angela Kula Sagar Sagaram, <laughs> CHFT Land Trust Coordinator. Um, and please let me know if that's uh, the correct pronunciation. All right. And so just the purpose of this workshop to gain a better understanding of how cooperative housing models operate, possible sort of best practices that could be adopted in our ward to support the growth and expansion of the cooperative housing sector in South Etobicoke. So to collectively brainstorm about feasible solutions, as we talked a little bit about earlier, right, everyone's at this frustrated breaking point of how do we um, bring in more affordable housing, and there's so much good work going on and so many things to be celebrated. So how can we advance this movement for all South the Topico um, residents, citizens, all the good people that live and work here. Um, and also the purpose is to engage with stakeholders from co-op agencies and organizations that are further ahead in the process and can assist in our efforts. Um, hence our wonderful invitation and gladly accepted to Angela. 
Um, so urgent need for alternative housing models, and then we're almost finished this section and we'll go on. Um, so the increase in vulnerable seniors living in private rental housing stock are being displaced in shelters. There's no housing security for the private rental market. Tenants are vulnerable to escalating rent increases in our ward beyond what they can afford. The increase in families and low income adults being evicted. Uh, and rent evictions. Um, I saw one yesterday, sadly. Um, increasing loss of affordable housing stock due to the commodification investment return on housing properties and demolition. And we see that a lot, for example, in the Christie sites and, um, you know, Van Dyke and, and many others. So right now, if it's possible, Kate, I'm going to hand it over to you for the brief introduction of La Hague, and then Angela will switch out your slides and we'll come back into our closing. Is that okay? I had to unmute myself. This is like a new <laughs> thing, you know, 2022. Unmute yourself, unmute yourself. I'm gonna uh, thank you, first off, for the introduction. And I will read off the, sli uh, off the slide here and do a little bit of uh, adjustment. The, um, the Lakeshore Affordable Housing Advocacy and Action Group, and you have to remember the advocacy side, La Hague, is a grassroots resident-led coalition and includes service providers, community organizations, and community leaders working towards housing justice and housing equity in South Etobicoke. We have been engaged in community development work around the housing issue for over three years. And we meet the first Tuesday of every month, uh, right now online, um, but we're hoping to get our meetings in person at LAMP and uh, sooner than later. And we have to, to discuss um, the affordable housing issue. And I just want to, uh, add to this uh, just our um, mission statement because it really, really is very clear. And uh, our mission statement is to support our neighborhoods to locate, protect, and develop safe, secure, affordable housing. So we're talking about all of South Etobicoke, all of our neighborhoods. Even though I live in New Toronto, I'm, I'm my our eye and La Hague's eye is all across South Etobicoke, and that's why we put our neighborhoods in there because we can be very site specific down here. You know, those of us from New Toronto don't want to talk to anyone from Mimico, <laughs> but we have to. Um, but we want to locate and uh, sorry, to locate, protect, and develop safe, secure, affordable housing. Safe. That the housing there, the housing stock is in good condition, secure. That your security intent, you have security in tenancy. So as long as you go by the rules and pay your rents on time or your housing charges, you will not be evicted out of the space. And affordable. Well, affordable means all sorts of different things to different people. But it, at uh, La Hague, we actually talk about deeply affordable. So we want the housing to cost no more than thirty percent of the family's gross income. So that's the idea of sort of where we have settled in La Hague after years and years and years of meeting. Um, we are looking at um, some land and we're looking at ways to find some land to start building and groups to start building with. And uh, I'm gonna hand it over. Wonderful. That is such exciting news. That's very cool work. It's funny, the new Toronto doesn't want to talk to Mimico. <laughs> We're all here. Um, so I just wanted to add, there's a, a little bit more to uh, Kate's um, wonderful presentation. So as she mentioned too, I was just going to put in the all candidates meeting tomorrow's at Daily Bread, May 31st. It's at 6 p.m. in person and it will be live streamed on YouTube. Uh, so just to advance, these are Kate's amazing contact details here. So the mission is, as Kate was saying, I should have advanced the slide, I beg your pardon. Um, again, to reiterate what she said here, it is to support our neighborhoods to locate, protect, and develop safe, secure, affordable housing. And so for more information here, most of us are familiar. Um, it'll be um, really, really important when, when others are on the call too, that these um, the website's up now, the information email's up now, it's, it's wonderful. So I'm just gonna give a brief introduction and we'll switch over to Angela's slides, which are much, much prettier than mine, I'm very sure. So please welcome our guest speaker, Angela Hulasagaram, CHFT Land Trust Coordinator. She's a mentor, a trusted source in the co-op housing space that we are so pleased to have the knowledge sharing here with us today. So please join me in welcoming our guest speaker. And then Angela, I thought with regard to your bio, you'd maybe like to say a few words because I was researching you and you've done a lot of cool work. So 
So I'm just going to stop sharing mine now and then we'll let um, Angela, she can share her slides or I can do that for her if she prefers. Oh, I can share my slides. Thank, Thank you, Vanessa. So I will um, put them on the screen. I'm going to see. When I go into presenter view, Vanessa, you'll see it because I think um, you're a host, but I think everyone yeah. else will be able to see the, the rundown. Yeah. Yeah. Hold on. Why is that? Okay. There we go. Okay. So, um, Kate, can you, can, is Kate a host? I don't believe that she is. Let's see. Okay, I just want to know if everyone can just see my slide alone and not the presenter view. I can see oh, your the slide and next slide. Yeah. So, uh, Kate, or or anyone else that is not on co-host, can you see one slide or do you see one through thirteen? I see one big slide and then the next slide and then at the bottom of the okay. screen are all your slides. Yeah. Okay, so let me, um, <laughs> it's not going to work. <laughs> okay, perfect. I'll just share it this way then. Okay, okay, so before I get started, I wanted to thank, thank Vanessa, thank um, Kate for inviting me. I, I was really sorry I couldn't make it to the last um, presentation. And I'm happy that I'm able to be with you this afternoon and also tomorrow evening. Um, so my name is Angela Kulasagram. Don't worry about pronouncing. Vanessa, it's taken me 30 some years to figure out how to pronounce my last name, so it's not a problem. Um, I work at the Cooperative Housing Federation of Toronto, and I've been there for, I think, four or five years now, and I was doing a lot of work with them prior to that, just as a consultant. Um, prior to my work as a land trust coordinator, I was working specifically as uh, in the member services side, so that's where I met Kate and some other folks I recognize on the call because uh, we have 170 members that are um, part of our membership. And so on the member services side, our role is to provide um, education, advocacy, uh, support to our member co-ops whenever they need it. But now I've moved into the land trust side, which is um, what I'm going to talk about today, but also uh, potential new development um, within the co-op sector. And hopefully there's something of value from what I'm talking about today that people can take away uh, with them. Okay. Vanessa, is there anything else you would like to say before I? No. no. Thank okay. Thank you. Okay. So I spoke with Kate prior to um, this presentation. Kate, I don't know if you remember, it seems like ages ago at this point. And I I tried to focus specifically on what I thought um, this group was look, interested in. Um, so this isn't going to be a be all umbrella or um, uh, presentation about co-op housing. I'm going to be very focused in uh, ward specific about co-op housing, as well as um, a specific model that we're now looking at. So hopefully that gives people some ideas of how they can they can take away this presentation take it back to their communities and um, figure out how to be advocates for more affordable housing in their neighborhood so what i'm going to go through are the following items first who we are um, because before i could speak about our work uh, i need to also just make sure everyone has an understanding of what the cooperative housing federation of toronto does also a definition of a housing co-op. Um, we like to all talk about co-ops and there's a huge push now for co-ops, but it means different things to different people. So I thought we would get um, a definition going so that everyone is familiar with what kind of housing co-op I'm speaking about uh, specifically. Then I will go through a list of Ward 3 housing co-ops just for information for people living in uh, that area. Um, our development record, uh, then our co-op housing land trust, which is what I specifically work on, and then briefly about housing co-op models. Okay, so who exactly are we? So I said I work for the Co-op Housing Federation of Toronto. We've actually been around for 48 years, and a large part due to members that are living in co-ops, uh, recognizing that there need to be some sort of support services for housing 
uh, co-op after their develop after their development, but also prior to their development, there were a number of different resource groups that worked through CHFT to develop new housing co-ops, including in the South Etobicoke area. So right now we're predominantly a uh, member services a cooperative organization and we have nine staff. We represent over 40,000 members living in 170 co-ops in Durham, Toronto and York. And for the past 48 years, we've worked with co-op boards and service managers to promote and support the preservation of housing co-ops for our members. What we are well known for this type of Work, but we're less known for our development work and our land trust. So I'm, I'm happy that that's something your group's interested in. And I'd like to speak about that specifically. So what exactly are housing co-ops? There are a number of different um, co-ops throughout the world. And if you just Google co-ops, you'll see farming co-ops, you'll see workers co-ops, mountain equipment co-ops. People are very familiar with many different co-ops. So mm -hmm. when we talk about housing co-ops, uh, what we're saying is that they're intentional, thoughtful communities with active member involvement. So they're controlled by the members who vote in decisions, everything from housing charges to where that money should be spent in the budget, on the financial statement. Um, they have a right, members who live in a co-op, we don't call them tenants, we don't call them rent, we call uh, co-op uh, residents members and we call our rent housing charges. All of these things are decided by members in an annual general meeting or a general members meeting and they vote. So every member has a say in how the intentional community operates. And each housing co-op is a legal association that is incorporated as a cooperative. So a lot of times I get calls from people um, in saying, you know, I wanna live in a co-op and I see that you have all these co-ops, how do I get in? And I have to unfortunately say, to them, we have nothing, CHFT has nothing to do with co-op membership applications. We have nothing to do with co-op um, organization. That is all co-op specific. Co-ops are independent legal associations that operate on their own with the members that live in that co-op. So an application in one co-op in South Etobicoke, you walk down the street to another co-op could be completely different. Um, each co-op has its own board of directors. Each co-op has its own membership, own um, community, own identity. So every co-op is not exactly the same in that way. And the purpose of uh, housing co-ops is to be affordable and provide security of tenure. And the security of tenure piece is critical. And that's something Lahag, just, uh, Kate just expressed. Uh, families can, as long as you're file, uh, following the bylaws, so every co-op has a number of bylaws that members approve, as long as you're following the bylaws, you can stay there as long as you want. Um, there's no push for members to move out of the co-op, um, and they're mixed, and predominantly they're mixed income communities, so there are people that are paying 100% of CMHC's average market rents, and there are people that are paying 30%. Uh, so there's deeply affordable and affordable in their spectrum. And so th that kind of community is intentional. We want people to uh, mix with pe different people of socioeconomic backgrounds and, and their diverse communities. So that's a brief explanation of the housing co-op that I'm speaking about specifically. And then I wanted to share this chart with you because lots of people confuse us for Toronto community housing. They think about subsidized housing or affordable housing. And there's a sense that all subsidized housing runs like Toronto community housing. But as I mentioned earlier on, uh, each co-op is an independent organization that's in a legal organization and they have an organizational structure. And this is the general structure of every single housing co-op that you encounter in Toronto. Um, the, the members are um, the ones at the top of this uh, quote unquote hierarchy. They appoint um, or they vote on the board of directors who are other uh, representatives in the co-op, so other members in the co-op. Those boards also have committees, so there could be a gardening committee, a social committee, a finance committee, and then there's a president and vice president, et cetera, et cetera. And then the board of directors hires a manager or property staff um, or a coordinator. They also, and then that, that company or manager hires other professionals, like a landscaper, a bookkeeper, an administrator, other staff. And then the check and balance here is the auditor. The auditor is um, the person that the members approve. It's, it could be a, it's a firm usually, it could 
be an independent uh, consultant as well. And the auditor generally just states if there's any issues going on with the co-op's finances and reports directly to the members, not to the staff. So this is the typical structure of um, an organizational structure of a co-op. So in your area specifically, I did a little bit of research. I'm not sure with the changes in wards, uh, but I do think this is accurate. So there are about 1,018 co-op units in Ward 3 alone. And I've listed all the co-ops in your neighborhood. Um, and the ones that have this little asterisk beside them are the land trust co-ops. So co-ops that CHFT had a part in either developing or when they were developed, they were committed into our land trust. So you can see, um, and every single one of these co-ops besides Norris Crescent is a provincially funded co-op that was downloaded to the city of Toronto during uh, the Harris Cut. So these all, um, all of these units uh, receive a rent geared to income supplement and also an operating supplement from the city of Toronto. North Crescent, it was created with a federal subsidy. Yes, Carolyn? Oh, Carolyn, you had your hand up. I think you were trying to unmute and you turned off your video. Yeah, okay, I got it. Um, you missed my co-op. Oh, what's your co-op? Um, William Punnett co-op. Oh, okay. Yeah. I don't. So I don't know if with the boundaries changing, if it's well, still. Does it, if it's, no, it, it is the same because we're right across the street from all of these you you have mentioned. So okay, but well, good yeah. to know. Then I'll add that to the list. Yeah, but I don't know. We're still under federal. So I don't know whether that makes a difference either, but no, no, because North Crescent, North Crescent is federal. So yeah. we may have, because we have, we have Etobicoke classified uh, and we have these lists intentionally because anytime there's an election, we want to go to the local MP or MPP and, and uh, rally um, and mobilize our community, our co-op community together to advocate for more co-op housing or co-op priorities. Um, so it's good to know. So we can add William Punnett. I know that when I looked through the list, it was, um, William Punnett was in another <laughs> another ward. So maybe that's an error on our part. Yeah. Thank yeah. you, Carolyn. Okay, thanks. Okay, so I think I skipped over. Okay, so I wanted to speak directly to our development record. And this is something that's lesser known to many of our co-op members and uh, um, the co-ops that are part of our membership. Because for a long time, we've been uh, a part of the membership services side where we're providing direct services to co-ops. Our development record is not something that a lot of uh, members know about or were part of. So since 1978, CHFT has built 59 housing co-ops that have produced 6,321 affordable housing units. And so at the beginning of our organization, it was predominantly development. That was a huge part of CHFT's um, uh, role was to get as much federal or provincial funding as possible to commit projects, to develop as much affordable housing as possible. So if you look at the decades, what I've done is I've taken our um, the number of co-ops and the number of units and I put them by decades in terms of development. So what's interesting here is most of the co-ops were formed in the 80s and 90s. And you can see the huge number of units that were formed. Um, I have resources that are uh, that I have in the last slide, but I've also sent Vanessa something to send out to people who are attending. And in some of the um, materials that I'm sending out, you can read about the size of co-ops. So, so it's not just that there are 30 co-ops, but how big are those co-ops? Because you could have 30 co-ops with only five units, for example. Um, in the 80s and 90s, they were predominantly 100 plus uh, units. And this is why you get this many units of affordable housing, which accounts for the, for the 6,321 units. After that, 
you can see what's happened in the 2000s to 2020. There's only been four new affordable housing cooperatives committed and developed, and they don't even account for like less than 600 affordable housing units in two decades versus the two decades prior to that, how many units were committed. So why this huge drop off? Everyone always talks about the co-op heydays, why there's so many co-ops that were built and why they're not being built anymore. And people, I get calls every day from members and just interested residents and in saying, you know, my apartment building's gonna get sold. I saw Vanessa's intro about uh, rent evictions and just rents increasing. My apartment building's gonna get sold and how do we, how do we advocate to turn our apartments into co-ops? And what I say is it's really unfortunate. There are ways to do it, but with the price of land and the price to uh, and the cost of subsidizing members and the cost of operations without a government program it's really really hard to develop a housing co-op and that's the difference we see in the numbers it's hard data in the 80s and 90s there were huge programs for through the federal government and the provincial government who were in the business of housing to develop affordable housing that is why CHST was in that business of development, because you could get money not only to buy land, but also for infrastructure to actually build the co-op and then also to house people. So you would get some subsidies as well. So there was a supply side subsidy where there was actual subsidy for developing affordable housing units. And then there was also a subsidy for members. Um, the operations of the co-op also got subsidized. And so this is why there were so many committed projects during this period. When those programs were cut in the 90s, you can see an immediate effect in the next decade with how many affordable housing units were actually developed. And it's getting harder and harder. So even though there were two in 2000 to 2009, they accounted for 425 units, but the next decade, we get less than 100 units, even though we have two co-ops. So you can see that without a government program, it's really, really challenging for co-ops to develop. So as part of our record, what exactly did we build? So earlier on, we said HFP is a cooperative for each block volunteer to be a part of our organization. We have 170 co-ops. You're breaking up. Oh. <laughs> a lot of clicking. Breaking up. Okay. You're, yeah, you were breaking up quite a bit there. I apologize. Just, oh, no, that's okay. It's my, it's these, I think I've used these, these air okay. are dead. Just from the beginning of this slide. So we heard what we built and then it went like crackly robots. <laughs> okay, well, that's kind of like our development record because of the programs <laughs> falling off. Okay, so <laughs> we developed, can you hear me? Am I clear now? Beautiful, uh -huh. very clear. Okay. So we developed 45 new housing co-ops and an exam and the latest example of that is local 75 it's actually called local 75 hospitality workers and this was a project that um uh councillor pam mcconnell who's uh unfortunately passed away was a huge part of developing there were a number of hospitality workers who were coming down to downtown from far away and they didn't have safe affordable housing and and she was instrumental and she was a, an avid believer in um uh in co-ops so she was instrumental in creating um this co-op and they're part of our membership and we also helped in their development that so those are 40 45 new co-ops another way we've developed co-ops is through acquisition and this is i think what a lot of members uh, or what a lot of residents are interested in now you live in a building right now and you want to be able to turn it into a co-op and through acquisition we developed another 14 co-ops from existing properties so an example of this is city park housing co-op which is located in downtown as well it's 772 co-op units which is i think the second largest 
co-op in North America outside of New York's public housing. Um, so this was a property, there are three buildings. Um, they were put up for sale uh, and repeated rounds for sale and they weren't getting any uh, bite, like anyone to bite. And uh, we were foolish enough to risk a lot of funds to purchase the land and purchase the buildings and we've put them into a land trust. So now they're deeply affordable um, housing units. Um, they're focused on, it's located in the heart of uh, the gay village. And so a lot of uh, the subsidies we've prov uh, that are provided for that, um, for that, uh, uh, for those uh, buildings are for people who have HIV, who uh, may have otherwise very challenging um, health issues and really difficult, have a lot of difficulty in finding affordable housing. So we're really proud of those buildings. Um, they are still there. So if we hadn't uh, purchased them, I'm not sure what would have happened to those three buildings because they're in a prime location and at Church and Young. And so around it is huge condo development. The uh, motel, the Marriott Motel is redeveloping in that area. So I'm sure they would have turned into some sort of high rise condo building. So some of these developments, not all of the developments are part of our land trusts and we refer to the land trust now. So we have a number of different land trust corporations, but for the ease of reference, we just uh, call them the co-op housing land trusts, so the CHLT. So what exactly is a co-op housing land trust? So since the 80s, we have created and administered several land trusts, and the CHLT is just an umbrella term to make reference to these trusts. Each co-op within the land trust leases either the land or building or both from one of our land trusts, and the Typically, the leases are 49 years. Um, the CHLT ensures that when each co-op pays off their mortgage, the units will remain in the co-op sector. So the buildings can't be sold. Uh, the land can't be sold um, by the members because, again, as I stated earlier, um, co-ops are uh, legal uh independent bodies organizations and their members we don't want the idea coming up uh, coming out that hey maybe we should sell these buildings and purchase them for ourselves for example we want to make sure that the buildings are there in perpetuity for anyone who'd like to live in affordable housing so we want future generations to enjoy the benefits of co-op housing for years to come so even though we're, we were part of a lot of developments, every resource group, and these were groups that developed housing, so there was like the Labor Council, Labor Council for example, they each had a different idea of what exactly a co-op should look like and its organization. So that's why we have some co-ops in, in land trusts, because that resource group really believed in putting a co-op into a land trust, and some co-ops that were not ever put into a land trust. So in total, we actually have 32 co-ops that are part of our land trusts, and that represents uh, 10,000 members or um, four approximately 4,000 affordable housing units. So our land trust um, is considered the biggest in North America. So I'm... We're talking about different land trusts and we all, I, I earlier on defined housing co-ops specifically about what we were taught, what I was talking about, who our co-op members are, but around the world, the cooperative housing model, it is very flexible and has different, many different forms. So for example, if you go to Denmark, um, there are Germany, they have different types of uh, co-ops and co-op organizations and they're huge. Um, organizations in both of those countries, including an ownership model, co-ownership models as well. And we don't have those specifically in our membership. In Canada, the housing co-op models we have are the equity co-ops, nonprofit co-ops, seniors co-ops, artist co-ops. The equity co-op model is not something I'm familiar with or my organization works on. We don't have co-ops that have uh, in our uh, membership that are equity co-ops and we haven't developed any equity co-ops, but they do exist. And that's where basically um, members have a share in the housing uh, co-op and they can take that share with them when they leave. Um, and 
it's part it's it's part ownership and so none of our co-ops are um, organized in that way we do uh, all of them are nonprofits. we do have a number of co-ops that are seniors co-ops we have a number of co-ops in our membership that are artist co-ops okay so everyone um i know is here is interested in what we mean by a new model of co-op housing i know when i was speaking to kate about this this was something um she was really interested in and Naismith Co-op, as you saw in our earlier development record, there hasn't been any new development. So what that's forced, rightfully so, is the sector at large to kind of figure out what exactly we should um, do to get more co-op units. If there's no government programs anymore, um, or it's really challenging for us to tap into government resources, because there's a lot of us buying for a few, fewer and fewer dollars, um, the Toronto market's also really, really expensive to just land bank, which we did back in the day where we could purchase land and wait for a program and then add buildings to that land. Um, we can't do that anymore. So what exactly can we do? So we saw an opportunity um, in 2012, and this is largely part of political advocacy. My executive director, Tom Clement, and our organization, we've been around for a long time. So Tom is very, um, is a huge advocate for affordable housing and has been instrumental in um, advocacy and creating relationships with people like Councillor pa uh, Pam McConnell and also um, Adam Vaughn, who was an MP and is now retired from that position, but has been in the housing movement for a long time. So he had approached us and said, there are some condos that are um, get it, or will be developed and we're trying to figure out how do we get some of those units to be co-op housing units. So this is a really new model for us. Typically every single co-op that we have dealt with or have been part of building have been on their own. They've been from start to finish, every single unit is a co-op unit. We've never had a co-op uh, inside of a condo building before and given how many towers are that are going up we're really hopeful that we can expand this uh, model so in 2012 there was a number of sector leaders that came together and entered into an agreement with the city of Toronto and Tridel that there would be a handful of units so this this condo has 65 stories and we secured 12 of those units. So it's a very, very small amount of units. Um, and we, what we first did was we created a land trust. So it's called the Naismith Land Trust. And under the land trust, in this new land trust model, we have uh, one division. And that division is called 10 York Street because that's the address for this building. And we added those 12 units and in with the hope that in the future, if there's another condo anywhere else in um, the greater Toronto area, that we will be able to add another division with more uh, units from that condo. So basically this land trust is a vehicle for growth through acquisition. So we're no longer in the business of building those units. Um, Tridel built the building. They just gave us, um, through the City of Toronto agreement, they gave us those units. And because they're part of the land trust, at any point, if we as an uh, organization have challenges managing or administering those units, then we would give them back to the City of Toronto and they would be, again, turned into some sort of... Um, affordable housing uh, for people to uh, use. So uh, the, I was in really in, a big part of my role was to help with occupancy for these units. So uh, in their in their new development phase. So in 2018 was when the building was built, not fully built, not ready for occupancy. But in um, we had our first seven units, which were two bedrooms. And then in the following year, we got the other five, which were one bedrooms. And we did a lottery system for both. And we had over a thousand applications for 12 units. And so you can see how, and we all are very familiar with the housing crisis, how deep, uh, the deep need for affordable housing. And we don't know why, but through the lottery, we're really happy. It was a number of 
um, single parent led households that ended up moving into the building. There are no subsidies for the building. So there isn't a typical um, rent gear to income component, but the ha housing charges are uh, between 80 to 100% of uh, CMHC's average market rents. So they are affordable from that perspective. Um, we have had very little turnover in those units. People, there, it's right in front of um, Jurassic Park or in the heart of Jurassic Park, where um, I never know what it's called the ACC, the Rogers Center, the Scotia Bank, what, whatever that arena is, that's where it is. Uh, so it's young families that are able to um, raise their children. And we do have also young professionals who are entering the uh, uh, housing market and really have little to no options. So it's we're it's really a great model and we're hoping to get more units. The, the beauty about this is that it's not a traditional co-op. So a lot of our co-ops have done really well, but some co-ops they they haven't done well, whether it's governance or lack of management or the lack of investment in capital. And so another challenge we face is getting governments to buy into the co-op story. Um, they don't necessarily, the federal governments left the business of housing, the provincial governments left the business of housing. So getting these bodies to believe in co-op housing is challenging sometimes. So what the great thing about this model is that it's not the co-op itself, those 12 units, it does not have a board. The board sits with the Naismith Land Trust and it consists of different um, sector leaders uh, who um, review financial statements and the audit and they're the ones that approve the budget. And then as each division gets added, if we add more units, then each division could, could potentially have one representative from their division on the board. So ultimately, most of the decision making will be with the sector leaders. Um, and so this is more of a, we're hoping to take more of a portfolio approach um, to co-op housing. Uh, so that if there is an issue um, with a particular co-op, we're hoping that maybe we can move them into, into Naismith and provide some supports if we're able to grow um, the land trust. Okay, so opportunities for growth. So I said earlier, uh oh I said earlier, um, there aren't many opportunities we've seen past 2000 for growth. A lot, most times I've, I've told people um, they can apply to the co-investment fund through CMHC and that's been really challenging to kind of go through that proposal for many people. Um, also land acquisition has been uh, challenging. You're competing with the private market. So our role is predominantly, or my role is to go to city meetings and say, you know, Yes, we value the dog park, but we also want to see if you can use a community benefit to um, build more affordable housing units. So we don't want to be competing with uh, a dog park as a social benefit. That's, there's also value to our members for that, but we don't want to be um, uh, silent in saying, well, if, a con if there's, the public is the one that made the public investment in all of these sites that are now very valuable, and we want to make sure that the public in turn gets a benefit for having affordable housing in a, those condo units. So there was a lot of nimbyism actually for that 10 York development. It's 65 tor stories with a thousand plus units, but people in the community were saying, well, we don't, what, if we have those affordable housing units in our neighborhood, what does that mean for our condo value, our land value? And so Tom was um, clear uh, in saying there are only 12 units. It's not going to impact anything because it's a very nominal amount of affordable housing in your area. So we also have that um, to combat as well. Everyone likes to talk about how they want to have affordable housing in their co-op, or I mean, in their um, neighborhood, but when it does knock on their door, there's like, we like it, but not here. So that's something we also have to uh, come to terms with as well. So in recent news, what's been really, really great for um, the co-op sector is CHF Canada, which is a national co-op housing federation. 
um, adv successfully advocated and was announced in the federal budget for a new co-op housing development program. And it's committed $500 million in funding and then another billion dollars in loan uh, where co-ops, existing co-ops who want to potentially develop um, more units on their site or can potentially do that with this fund, knowing that it's $500 million for the entire country. And that's a lot, but not really. When you boil it down to what it actually costs to build a co-op and how many units you want, the $500 million is going to get taken up really quickly. Um, but this is the first sign we've seen from the feds who their interest in co-op housing specifically, not just nonprofit housing, not just supportive housing, um, but co-op housing. Okay. So I have a couple of resources for people to check out after. Uh, one is the co-op housing guide, because I know I probably get a lot of questions about how to build or develop a co-op after. Um, we were part of this uh, process, but there were a number of different organizations also part of this process in developing this guide. And it's a really helpful guide about co-op housing in general. And then uh, CMHC was also, also funded um, a new housing models report, which I've also included. So you can go look at that report and it will talk about the equity co-ops if people are interested in that and other models um, potentially that uh, people could explore outside of what we are very familiar with. So on my end, that's all I have to um, talk about today. I, I guess I can now open it up to questions or comments. Uh, Angela, that was really, really informative and, and greatly appreciated. Are you able to send us the links for those two, the guide and the housing model? Uh, yeah, you know what I didn't do? I'm going to, I will send it to um, uh, Vanessa right now. But what I'm going to do also is just put it in the chat so that you can download them right now too. So you don't have to wait for Vanessa. Not that... Uh, Thank you very much. It, but she probably <laughs> has a lot of other things she's also doing. It's okay, no problem. What a fantastic presentation. I learned a lot. And it's funny because everything that you were saying, I had the question was just answered again. Uh, so what were some of the concerns that you had in getting like the challenges between the 12 model co-op? And then I was about to ask me, you said nimbyism as well was there. Um, I had no idea there was such a significant drop off. And was that in the 90s? Was that just uh, when the government changed? Or was it like a sense of everything else? just a shift in government? Okay. Yeah, there was um, a, a couple of things happened. One specifically was um, there were the Fed, the federal government no longer wanted to be in the business of housing. So after they, they stopped producing or stopped developing our new agreements with um, housing providers. Okay. And at the same time, the provincial governments no longer wanted to be in the business of housing. So they downloaded all of their housing responsibilities to the 50 some odd service managers in Ontario. So, okay. yeah. yeah, so the city of Toronto's rent and, and didn't give them the funds necessary to actually um, account for those agreements. So a lot of co-ops that are, are uh, municipally funded, um, the city doesn't necessarily have the funds. And this is something that CHF Canada, the Ontario region is advocating for. What happens when their uh, mortgages and their agreements are over, um, are, if the government doesn't renew them, what happens to the subsidy for those, those co-ops? Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, I had no. So that no, was what the drop off was from. So extensive, yeah, because you were saying there's no longer funding for this uh, for the building, and there's also no longer funding for the subsidies of the actual uh, clients that live there. Um, yeah, yeah, I had no idea it was that extensive. The, I think the presentation was wonderful. It was tailored completely to the things that we're looking at, Kate especially and Lamp especially. Um, I see that Helen's hand is raised. Absolutely, go ahead, Helen. Um, I had two questions. Um, the first one is, do you see the Naismith land trust model as a way of perhaps purchasing units 
in all the Van Dyke developments that are happening along the, the Mimico GO station or what potentially will be developed on the Christie lands? Yeah, so right now we have another organization that we're uh, working with. It's a collaborative organize. It's a collaborative board called CAS. So it's with um, St. Clair's Multi Faith Housing, Habitat for Humanity, CHF Canada, uh, and CHFT. Um, and what we're working on is proposals for scattered units. So trying to get like room and bo like boarding houses right now that are um, uh, up for sale. There's another organization that's already doing that as well called Circle Land Trust. Naismith is really, really small. And the only income we have coming in is from those housing charges for the 12 units um, for the members that are living there. So we can't really leverage. So this is the risk that we constantly are trying to assess before we could leverage our assets or take out money, uh, to get money from the feds to purchase something and sit on it. And until another program came up, it was affordable. For us to purchase anything, we would have to leverage the rest of our land trust. And we can't, we don't want to put our members in that situation if there's a deal that goes bad. Mm -hmm. um, this is why we're not developing anything because there's no opportunity for us to buy anything at a fair market value because um, the costs have increased. The only thing that we've seen has worked are things like um, advocacy. So just having the number, the how many, what, what, whatever number of members in, or residents in a particular area telling their city councilor of, you know, when an application is coming forward to approve a new development on the site, saying there needs to be co-op housing specifically, we've seen makes an impact um same with the mp same with uh any elections we're just in fighting you know supportive housing and rooming housing co-op housing is very specific it's family housing um it's not specifically for root it's not rooming housing it's not um a group home for example it's long-term tenure and when i say family that doesn't exclude individuals it just means that it's it's for people to live and, mm -hmm. and grow in, in a community it's not transitional housing um but a lot of the funding right now we're seeing is going to those short-term um, right. homelessness initiatives yeah yeah the, the second point was um i didn't quite follow it when you were trying to explain how the 12 units in the Naismith were affordable, but there's not a subsidy. Okay, so when we entered into agreement with Tridel and the City of Toronto, Tridel agreed to provide those units at no little to no cost to the City of Toronto okay. as a as a community benefit. So usually when there is a new development in an area, um, developers are asked to provide some sort of community benefits. The example I gave was the dog park. Right. That's a community benefit or a playground or a parkland or something like that. So in this instance with the, an MP, Adam Vaughn, at the time he, I don't, he wasn't an MP, he was a city councilor. Um, he successfully uh, advocated for those, that there be units that are committed to um, affordable housing and they be co-op units. Be, and with that came um, waiving of development charges, property taxes, things that were incent the developer was incentivized to uh, provide those as affordable housing units. And then we then the co-op took out a mortgage, like it would in any instance. So every time a new co-op's developed, they take out a mortgage, and the mortgage that they took out, they didn't need as many as much funding to buy those units because they were not a million dollar plus units. So they could take the mortgage out and we can run, we can pay the um, condo fees, the co-op pays the condo fees for those units and just the general op operations with property management. Um, and that's why the co-op, it, it runs as a nonprofit, right? Okay. There's no additional funding there. So the two bedroom units are $1,200 and the one bedroom units are $1,000. And then each member, it comes with, um, for now, it comes with internet because it's part of the condo fees we pay. And so it's a pretty good, 
safe place those to are, live. Yeah, yeah, those are great prices. And the neighbors, if you go online and look at that, there are Tridels also um, in the rental business through their Dell Property Management Company. They have a number of units that are rent a rental, and the rents are four or five times that amount that they're renting those same units out for. And one of the things we were very insistent on is that we did not want the units to all be on the same floor. We didn't want to create, quote unquote, a poor floor where everyone said, you know, avoid the fifth floor. So because it's all, you know, subsidized, there are people who still think it's it's Toronto community housing. Not that there's anything wrong with Toronto community housing, but they're not understanding that it's a it's a co-op. And so we had that challenge as well, because this is the first time a co-op has a property management company that's not on site, but also they're in a building that already has a property management company through Tridel. So just kind of working through that, those growing pains has been challenging, but we're, we're, I think we're there. They also have to make arrangements for their own parking, but there's a locker if they want. Um, they have access to all the same amenities as any other uh, condo owner in the, in the units. Um, yeah, that's great. But Thank we you. We have a 1000 plus wait list. Yeah. Yeah. Now. Thank you, Angela. No problem. I think Carol and Ron. Angela, how successful have uh, you been in turning existing private market buildings into co-ops? That's my first question. My second uh, question or statement is um, where would I turn to you or uh, another source to find out how to do that? Because I'm in a situation where I'm in a low rise unit. Uh, we have four floors, 28 units. There's been a situation where the um, landlord, a single person has had to turn over, um, I guess the management to her daughter and um, things are turning around, but it's unfortunately been, you know, just kind of driven into the ground, but I do foresee the day when this building is going to be sold. So I was hoping that I could get some information and I do have a rapport with this landlord. So, um, you know, I would stage it, <laughs> but at least if I was aware and had the information in hand, I could approach this person and we could have a discussion when, if, and when that day arrived that they were going to be selling, which I think could be happening within three to five years. Um, so what is your success rate and can you provide me with info? Yeah, so in terms of acquiring a, a, a residents that live there wanting to purchase the building, our success rate was really good in the 80s and 90s when there was a government program for them to do that. So this is the challenge now. I get these calls all the now, all the time now, and it's heartbreaking where people are about to get rent evicted, and they want to mobilize and convince the landlord, who is a small landlord, um, that they should sell at some cost to the members over selling to the private developer, who's going to pay probably two to three times more than the residents can afford to actually take go so the first thing we don't have any i don't have any specific resources on that other than maybe the advice i can give right now which is to um, mobilize the tenants that live there and see if they actually want it to be a co-op because co-ops and land trusts are seen as solutions to problems but they're not really a solution to a problem like trying to acquire a building if you don't have the funds um people should not are treat co-op synonymously with unionized uh, like union like creating a union where you just get a number of people to sign off that they want a co-op and somehow it becomes a co-op and that's not the case you still have to purchase the building from the landlord and so if you have a community group that's willing to um, do that and say yes as a group we want to purchase the building from the landlord then you have to find out what the landlord's final number is and if the group will be willing to take out a loan from CMHC to through a bank to actually do that. Um, my experience and this is why I'm saying we don't have a success right now my experience is a lot of these 
landlords uh, were small time landlords who bought those buildings back in the day and now are wanting to profit because that's for their family and selling it to their estate, like their estate gets the funds. And as much as they like the tenants that have lived there for years and years and years, um, there's a strong appeal to sell to a private developer for way more than they paid for their the building to begin with. So we actually looked at a building to do what you're saying. It was half uh, vacant because it was in bad shape. Um, and then when we did the cost costing, we did a performa for it. We realized like we couldn't even afford to do that. It would be way too expensive. Um, so I don't want to sound discouraging, even though I, I understand how discouraging that can be. Um, but the first thing I would do is try to mobilize the, mem the re residents that live there and figure out what exactly they want to do. Um, do they want to meet with the landlord and can you get on, on message on brand to say, this? okay, once we meet with the landlord, find out the price, are we willing to take the risk and get a mortgage to buy the building? But to form a co-op, you need to incorporate a co-op mm -hmm. name, you need to have bylaws um, and you need to have a founding board, but there needs to be a residence that the, the, the bylaw states, the address that the bylaw states. So, uh, okay. Well, that's yeah. Very interesting. I, I, when you were talking about, you know, the cost and everything, um, unfortunately what has happened, um, the property manager who is related to the landlord, they, she alluded to me, or she actually said that they've had to go back and refinance. I guess what has happened, um, I guess the building was run into the ground by a succession of bad supers and it, it didn't get any better. And, and unfortunately the older landlord has possible dementia, but the, the building um, has been sort of run into the ground. Now she's been making all these, um, I guess, maintenance upgrades to to bring it to code and that and actually myself and another tenant got together and we called the city and orders were issued so basically she's been acting on the orders but she has gone like over and above which is good she just didn't do the minimum but she's had to refinance so um what you were saying there about you know the half empty building and the cost and everything because this building was built apparently in about 1961 so when they haven't um, replenished or put money back into the business, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So thank you very much for that. No problem, Carol. Thank you. I'm not sure if there are any other questions we have just in keeping um, everyone's time mindful. Um, I haven't had any other regrets. So I'm wondering if... Um, people maybe mistook the time for two o'clock and thought it's at seven in the evening. So I'm going to make sure with Eventbrite that I, I keep a, a tab on everyone. I'm going to send out another email, just reminding them and inviting them. But this presentation was very, very helpful. Like I was taking many, many notes. <laughs> um, so I thank you so much for sharing it and recording it. But I just had one quick brief thing in CBA work. I just want to find out from your perspective, what is the difference then when um, so for example, within the Christie sites, you know, if we're advocating for one whole floor to be uh, deeply affordable units as part of um, a legal agreement, how would that differ from the co-op unit? It would just be one would be a gift and a legal arrangement and one is actually because the co-op is um, an entity and a legal organization in itself, right? They would just be labeled differently. Sorry, Vanessa, maybe on. I'm not understanding the question. Like, okay. like how are, for example, how our Naismith co-op is different than <clears throat> the Tridel building? Uh, sort of, I understand. Yeah, exactly uh, how those are different. But then when you go into now, there's CBAs coming in as well, advocating for like entire floors or units to be uh, deeply affordable as a legal, like a completely legal agreement. How will that differ other than the structure of a co-op like Naismith? Um, how do we not overlap or are we essentially wanting the same things? We want, and that's what I said, we're competing with each other. Yeah. We essentially want the same thing, but potentially for different groups. Mm -hmm. And for example, like the rapid housing initiative would appeal to, would appeal to your group, but it wouldn't necessarily be Feels helpful true. to us if we're not providing supportive housing, for example. Okay. So we are competing, but 
my philosophy working on the land trust is as long as it's affordable, it doesn't have to be a co-op, but the developers are really, really profiting from the investment that the public has made in a certain area. So especially mm-hmm. like, for example, along the transit lines. So we should have a public benefit in return for the development of those lands. So if that's supportive housing or transitional housing or, or room, you know, rooming housing, like houses that have been converted, mm-hmm. we're for it as long as it's affordable housing. Good. But we are, if you're asking yeah. for and this is why <laughs> I was. This is I'm why we started working learned. with a group. Um, yeah, that's so what that you're I, talking about. say as a group, hey, you know, St. Clair's multi-faith housing, you're going in for this proposal. We're not going to go in. Or we are, and this is our proposal, so that we're very okay. transparent and not and trying not to compete with one another. And I, The other challenge we have is that it's, you know, not there's not many, if at all, nonprofits that are in the development business anymore. Yeah. So that's we're not. really, really waiting on um developers private market developers to take an interest in what we do and say yes this is what we want to develop but tridel all these like daniel's group um all all of these major um uh developers they have a subsidiary charitable arm to them or nonprofit to them so that they can provide all of that in-house as well they do, yes. And there's a lot of ROI that they have available the more and more and learning. And after your presentation, um, I, this is the first time that I think, and I'm not sure if a lot realize that that's a, a competitive, right? That's that's directly competitive. Um, so I like the idea of like a co-op, I mean, sorry, the model when you say you're going into a coalition um, and what not to do. That's something I have to think about and take notes of because I certainly would not want to be in competition with this. Um, I think that this is something much more valuable than potentially, but I'm going to have to follow up. And that's amazing. You brought that up. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and, really and another good. thing we're seeing too, is we have 170, 80 co-ops within our membership. We've expanded into Durham region as well. Yeah. And in the time frame in those eighties and nineties, you could, uh, you could be live in a student co-op and then have a partner and move into a bigger unit, have a family and then move into another co-op and then, retire and move down to a one bedroom. That happened during that time. Now, um, especially since the pandemic, we get called about vacancies because we keep vacancy lists. If co-ops tell us that they have a vacancy, they advertise with us. Since the pandemic started, we have not advertised a single unit for vacancy. There's not any co-op, there isn't a co-op that we know of that has a vacancy. Their lists are five, 10, and that's that's just in the last five years. So there, I like, I know there's service agencies and churches and organizations that are trying to find people housing. And we have, we don't have anything to offer them because none of the co-ops that we know have vacancies or if they do, they have uh, a huge waiting list. And some were wait lists were closed. I remember the wait lists were closed on most of them just right off the bat. I was looking at the scattered co-op model with wood, um wood wood glen i can't remember i always want to say wood green but it's not um willow glen no it's a wood wood starts first there's scattered co-ops over near riverdale i think um okay yeah and they they're everything's closed like the wait lists are closed um yeah and I think for our area, you've done a very good job of like highlighting the alternatives and what we can do and how we can mobilize. And although it's fairly challenging, disheartening, <laughs> there's it's hopeful, right? The, the group of people here, it's so hopeful. And I'm wondering too, in the essence of time, if maybe Jasmine wants to say anything, if she's still here. I know she was very busy today with other meetings as well. I'm here. I'm just going to... Uh, just that I really appreciate this workshop and I think it's given us lots of ideas and uh, uh, we appreciate everyone taking their very important time out to join us and we hope that they will uh, uh, stay with us and get in contact with us with either LAMP or La Hague or um, you know any of the work that we're doing if you're interested in supporting please let us know because we really need more uh, South Etobicoke community champions. So thanks, everyone. Thanks, Vanessa. Thank you, Jasmine. So just in the end, I saw Carol and Ron, um, I believe your hands up, I'll let you have the last question. I just wanted to make sure that everyone knows uh, this presentation is being recorded. And I'll make sure I send it out to the attendees in addition to Angela's wonderful resource she provided. 
but I am going to uh, send out another e-blast. So I apologize if you got it again, but we had an extensive registration list for this the first time. And I did confirm with the majority of those people that they would be coming today, but they're not here yet. So I'm going to send out an email just highlighting perhaps it was an error if they'd like to come and join us tomorrow night. So tonight is a wonderful, or today is like a wonderful, uh, we'll say an informative practice round <laughs> for tomorrow evening. Um, and what a great presentation. So please go ahead, Carol, and then we'll we'll thank Angela for her time and let her go on her afternoon. Go ahead. Uh, yes, Angela, you said that you did research on specifically on the co-ops here in South Etobicoke. Uh, I was wondering uh, where you did your research and would you be able to, um, I guess, send that list of co-ops that are actually here in South Etobicoke? Yeah, so my present, so we have access to a number of different different databases um one in like our in-house one and also um if co-ops have a consent to share agreement with their funders then they send us information so i can't necessarily send out the information about each co-op but the list that i did have on the slides like those slides i've shared in pdf form um with vanessa and she'll be able to send that to you and the, and the list is on there excluding carolyn's uh co-op william punnett which i have to add to the list mm -hmm. Okay, that would be that would be great because then I, I I'd like to be able to do some further research myself. So having a sort of a jumping off point that would be great. Thank you very very much for a most informative uh, presentation. Thank you, Carol. All right, um, I just wanted to remind everyone uh, if everyone can see the all candidates this evening, and then I'm going to send Angela a wonderful little like debrief. Um, thank you so much. That was really good, Angela. Do you have any questions for us or anything that you need clarification? No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. Um, Jasmine has her hand up again. Go ahead, Jasmine, please. I just wanted to just mention that uh, I, I think you said this evening, or at least that's what I heard. It's actually tomorrow evening, and it's oh. at the Daily Bread Food Bank, and sure, it's in yeah. person. So the meeting is tomorrow night, and uh, and we hope that some of you will attend. Yes, and can you all see the up on the screen now? That's the meeting Jasmine's talking about, the all candidates. Now we do have um, the second um, edition of this meeting. It's not a continuation, it's the se a secondary presentation also tomorrow night. So I do realize that some of you will be attending the all candidates in person um, and not, not a problem for those that have registered. I'm gonna send out a blast to all of my contacts and make sure we, we get the attendance too. Um, I don't want to compete with anyone. <laughs> and that last question, I think there's one more hand up other than Carol and Ron. Yep, no problem. Just a quick question. In order to attend in person at the tomorrow evening's all candidates meeting, do we have to register somewhere? Um, they ask you, but you know, if you let me know, that's fine. Or um, that's you can just go and you can register or you can just attend. Um, they will ask people to wear masks at the meeting. That's the only thing we, we want to let you know, and we'll have lots of masks there, but that's about it. Yeah, it should be really good, and it should be in, in person. And it's always really nice to meet the candidates. It is exciting. Um, so thank you so much for everyone that attended. Uh, what a wonderful, like I learned a ton and took so many notes. It was a pleasure meeting you, Angela. Thanks for being so accommodating with us. Um, and informative. And thank you all for taking the time for your afternoon. And I hope you learned something. And I will follow up with the resources to everyone that attended as well. Okay. Great. Thanks so Excellent. much. Everyone. That was a uh, great Vanessa, do you mind just staying on after I guess? Of course. Yeah, of course. Talk. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Have a nice rest of the day. Stay cool. <laughs> it's like 31 degrees. Yeah, I'm worried about vulnerable <laughs> people in this weather. Game and pets and everything. There we go. I think you can stop the recording, Vanessa. Yeah, I'm trying to get into my, there we go, there we go.